well, thank you to Ali and uh, Craig for organizing the session here um, in the UK, and thank you, Brian, for preempting sort of some of the. Th so I'll touch on some of the things that you talked about and go in a little bit of a different direction, especially in terms of, of life cycles. Um, so, to, so just to, to start off, so posthumanism scholarship has recently considered the relationship between humans and animals in hurting societies, and, and, and a lot of the uh, recent work done by Hannah Chazen has, has looked at that in a different, uh, in a different context. However, the study of uh, domesticated llamas and alpacas in the pre-Columbian Andes has focused more narrowly on questions of political economy and religious observances. And there have been few analyses that have examined how the breeding, rearing, and consumption of camelids condition everyday temporal rhythms or structured varied domains of social practice. In our paper, we present new data on the importance of camelid herding in the arid north coast of Peru. We argue that the constraints and affordances of the camelid life cycle set the parameters for the organization of the ritual economy and everyday social practices of the Moche ceremonial center of Huacacolorada, situated in the southern Hecatepeque Valley. We condition, we, sorry, excuse me, we contend that human agency and intentionality can only be understood within the complex meshwork of dependencies that inextricably linked humans and camelids into an integrative, if fluid, collective. This paper is inspired in part by the posthumous critique of narrow anthropocentric understandings of agency and archaeological interpretation. The butchering and sacrifice of yamas in the Andes, often as subordinate subjects of human caretakers, expose the obvious limitations of a radically symmetrical archaeology. Nonetheless, our paper acknowledges that agency can only be properly understood in terms of the complex web of cycles, rhythms, and material dependencies linking animals, people, and things. Lindstrom critiques the notion that things have agency and argues instead that the efficacy of in inanimate objects as aff affectants rather than as Latorian actants differs from the deliberated and calculated actions of humans and higher order animals. Although Lindstrom's position is open to criticism for downplaying differences in ontologies, as things certainly could, could be experienced as enlivened or agentive in different societies, her perspective nonetheless exposes the reductionism of symmetrical archaeologies. The material, technical, and ecological dependencies entangling humans and animals could differ in fundamental ways from uh, human-thing relationships. In fact, Lindstrom argues that vertebrates with central nervous systems exercise agency in ways that approximates traditional understanding of the term as entitling attention, will, and purpose. Following Rob, we recognize that objects, whether bridles, spindles, combs, and so on, depend, uh, demand consideration in, rec in reconstructing larger relational matrices making agency possible. However, the nodes and interdependencies forming the, the, the meshwork were far from arbitrary. The needs, biological cycles, and economic, economic affordances of camelids created an especially powerful force field in the shaping of social collectives and pastoral societies. The intrinsic material properties of clay or metal ore certainly set constraints on the organization of ceramic production or copper smelting. However, the scheduling and management of camelid herding are more profoundly determined by the physical biology of the animals. The biological cycles of gestation, birthing, rearing, growth, fiber extraction, and butchery would have significantly conditioned the timing and organization of larger tasks, including <coughs> agricultural production, fishing, and exchange. Indeed, the temporalities and materialities of living mammals obviously differ from more obdurate and inanimate things. As Lindstrom implies, the cycles of transformation and growth of animals sets them apart as primary agents in larger social collectors, collectives, and she follows uh, gel and relegates things to secondary agency. So turning to the Moche case study, we argue that growth, biological needs, and affordances of camelids structured both the daily and annual rhythms of social groups living in the southern Hecatepeque Valley during the Middle Horizon period. Camelids played a decisive role in the movement of people for the purposes of pilgrimage and exchange, and their upkeep and consumption underwrote a diverse range of ritual practices and economic activities beyond herding, including the harvesting of crops, the scheduling of feasts, and the exchange of goods between pastoralists, agriculturalists, and fishing communities. The term Morte does not designate a bounded ethnic group, but denotes many polities that adopted a similar political and religious ideology during the early first millennium. Mocha ideology and material culture was adopted through the desert north coast of Peru, extending north to the Piura Valley and as far south as the Warme during the early intermediate and middle horizon periods. 
The Moche are well known for their lavish tombs, sophisticated irrigation networks, and the beauty and naturalism of their ceramic um, and metallurgical art. The long-held view that the Moche formed the first state-level society has proven controversial, and recent research points to considerable variation in political organization throughout this period. The ceremonial center of Wakakulorara, the l largest late Moche site on the southern bank of the Hecatepeque River, was occupied between 8600 uh, and 50 to 8850. Wakakulorara is comprised of extensive residential areas that surround an elevated temple complex. There is evidence that communities of pilgrims, artisans, and large camelid herds visited the site on possibly cyclical basis, and as uh, indicated by superimposed and informal domestic uh, constructions. Wakakulorara <coughs> is located at a key crossroads between Moche polities and likely served as the ceremonial and political headquarters of a religious cult that dominated the southern Hectopeke Valley. Pilgrims and artisans appear to have journeyed to the center to worship and pay respects to a powerful waka, or other than human power associated with the temple. This interpretation is supported by the recovery of high quality decorated feasting vessels unearthed in the ex expansive domestic and ceremonial sectors. Tributes in uh, labor and offering to the waka were reciprocated with corn beer and protein rich meals of camelid meat as well as seafood. In fact, camelid meat was not limited to elite groups but was widely consumed by all statuses. The role of camelids at the center is supported by the recovery of a high quantity of osseous remains, as well as the discovery of juvenile camelid, camelid sacrifices within the monumental core, found in association with human offerings, adobe altars, and occasionally copper artifacts. The discovery of high quantities of Cajamarca finewares and feasting middens surrounding the ceremonial district of the site reveal that Huacocolada maintained long distant contacts with highland polities and formed an important node of exchange on the coast. Six years of excavation in the ceremonial core of Wakakulada indicates that five major modes of ritual were orchestrated at the center. Pilgrims to the site by, the di by di diverse communities to pay respects to a powerful waka or lord, the dedication and termination of architectural constructions, including rooms, patios, and most notably uh, ceremonial platforms, the interment of offerings of human and animal sacrifices, large scale commensal rites involving both elite diacritical banquets and more inclusive patron client feasts as well as rituals likely related to copper metallurgy. However, these rites were all interrelated and served ultimately to promote life, fertility, and, and proper reciprocal bonds between social collectives and ontological others. Camelids secured a central place in this multifaceted ceremonial complex. The breeding, care, butchering, consumption of, possibly, of a possibly sacred herd not only underwrote the ritual economy, but likely dictated the timing and organization of different ritual events. Soon to be conducted isotopic analysis of camelid bone and uh, teeth remains will better identify the possibly diverse origin of animals and peoples to this center. As illustrated in this bar chart, camelids dominate the faunal assemblage of Wakukulada with two domestic zones containing only slightly fewer remains than the feasting middens surrounding the central ceremonial district of, of this site. Most of the remains originate from large middens of the ceremonial area of the site with 80% of the fauna identified as camelid. To date, we have uncovered five juvenile camelids, four of which were found in association with adolescent human sacrifices, with the fifth found in the production domestic or pr production slash domestic zone of sector A, um, in association with the burial of an adult woman and a six-month-old child. The deposition of camelids in ritually charged architectural spaces, along with human sacrifices, reinforces their value as prized and active members of society. This evidence supports that camelids were valued as both meat offerings and as ritual media, and um, as has been uh, documented at Moche tomb sites elsewhere, both in this valley and, uh, and farther north. Our research suggests that the biological needs and life cycles of camelids substantially dictated the ritual and economic practices of Wakukulada residents and visitors. The taskscapes of breeding, gestation, rearing, and feeding structured many other key practices of the site, including the time and timing of transhumanists, feasting, worship, and possibly fishing and farming. In the Andes, camelids tended to be seasonally <coughs> bred in the rainy season from November to April, which corresponds to the season of agricultural cultivation on the coast. Camelid gestation is 342 to 350 days, a cycle that seems to have structured other annual tasks. The signs for pregnancy are difficult to identify in early stages, making the maintenance of herds challenging, especially for pastoral groups that needed to re remain in one location for birthing to occur. 
The seasonal birthing of camelids along with their long gestation placed many constraints on past populations. Pastoralists had to stay at locales for prolonged periods of time to allow for proper care and for the rearing of offspring. Ethnographic documents indicate that sub-adult camelids joined, uh, would, would have joined ca caravan herds <coughs> approximately um, 24 months after birth. Before reaching this age, rearing and training were necessary during, during this first two-year period of life. The cost of maintaining herds from procuring fodder to breeding was considerable. An examination of the mortality profiles from Wakakulata sheds light on how the life cycles of camelids structured and constrained the tasks of, of the Wakakulata religious community. The importance of camelids as an economic and dietary resource cannot be overstated at, at this site. Camel mortality profiles um, have, have been compiled through assessing long bone fusion. The analysis of uh, the ratio of fused and unfused bones reveals that most camelids were butchered before the second year. Thus, the Wakukulata evidence indicates the mo that most camelids butchered for feasts were young and ranged between 1.5 and 2 years. This age, at this age, camelids would have reached their maximum size. An assemblage of camelid remains indicate a high number of older animals, mainly over three years of age, and this would suggest that camelids were being reared for wool. In the case of Wakukulara, this was not the case. Instead, the uh, sacrifice and consumption of juvenile camelids was, uh, was prioritized. As mentioned, the evidence shows that there was substantial feasts at the site demanding large numbers of camelids, and we also have evidence that people were traveling long distances to reach Wakokolada, transporting large quantities of ceramics from the Cajamarca region in the highlands. The age profile suggests that different communities traveled to the site to possibly breed their camelids, and actively an activity charged with as much symbolism as feasting and fostering a sense of belonging to a larger community that transcended uh, parochial kin ties. These groups may have soon uh, departed and then returned a year or so later for the camelids to give birth, leaving young, am uh, young animals as offerings. In fact, the discovery of the sacrifice of a pregnant woman in one of the decommissioned altars of the East ceremonial precinct suggests that rites surrounding intercourse, birth, and gestation formed a central pr uh, preoccupation of the ritual specialists of, of this particular moche center. During these visits, Pilgrims could have contributed other forms of tribute and feast on the offspring of earlier cam camelid unions. The attendant herds of juveniles would have been reared, consecrated, and butchered for the lavish feasts underwriting the ritual economy of the site. Groups of pilgrims coming and going with their adult herds could account for the pronounced imbalance between num the number of juvenile and adult remains recovered at Wakakulada. The adults may have also transported the high quantity of Cajamarca bulls discovered at this site from the highlands. To consider an alternative scenario, pilgrims may have simply just brought young camelids to the center, but this exchange is not supported by ethnic, the ethnographic record, so pulling in some these other, other sources. In fact, 1% of the assemblage of nearly 4,000 camelid bone fragments display uh, uh, bone growths or exostoses on the phalanges and in some instances on the pelvic bones. This small percentage shows that most young camelids in this assemblage were possibly not herded to the site but were locally bred. Fisher folk and agricultural, agriculturalists would have also likely come to the site when many camelids were ready for sacrifice and consumption. The prolonged and problematic gestation and management of the herds would have made the scheduling of these feasts a very challenging task. Indeed, Wakakulara appears to have been obsessed with marking and controlling the passage of time, as indicated by the numerous ritual renovations of the ceremonial district and the discovery of an astronomical installation that seemed to charter the movement of the sun. To, to conclude, the overall more, more, um, mortality profile of camelids at Wakakulara is noticeably younger compared to other research in the Andes region, especially the, the highland regions. Once the camelids were of an appropriate size and age, they were culled and their remains were deposited in the extensive midden areas surrounding the, the, ceremon uh, the ceremonial architecture. The multiple renovation phases at, at Wakakulara may have coincided with rituals of mass camelid breeding, sacrifice and butchering, and these charge events no doubt affected the tasks and ritual calendars of, far, of farmers and fisher, fishing communities that visited this site. Thanks so much.